morning. My name is Simon the Zealot, and I'd like to tell you my story this morning, if I might. Uh, But before I do that, I want to ask you a question. And the question I want you to consider is this, is why do you follow Jesus? Do you follow Jesus because of what you get out of following Jesus? Or do you follow Jesus because he is Lord and King? Do you try and mold Jesus to who you want him to be? Or do you try and mold your life to who he wants you to be? Do you follow Jesus on his terms, or do you follow Jesus on your terms? And as I tell you my story this morning, my story is really a story of learning and understanding to follow Jesus on his terms and what he wants instead of on my terms and what I want from him. So as I said, my name is Simon the Zealot, and I was one of Jesus' 12 disciples. And You probably know many of Jesus' disciples. There were certainly the famous ones. There is Peter, right? And he gets a lot of press. He was called the rock. He was the guy that walked on water. He said some brilliant things and some really stupid things. And then there's James and John, also pretty famous. Their father was Zebedee. They were brothers. They were sometimes called the sons of thunder. And then you have some other disciples that are a little bit lesser known. There's Philip, there's Thomas, who earned the nickname of Doubting Thomas. And those are some of the famous disciples. And then, of course, you have the infamous disciple, Judas Iscariot. And then there's me. And there's not a whole lot in the biographies of Jesus that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wrote about me, but there's a little bit. And perhaps the most telling thing about me is my nickname, Simon the Zealot. Now, when Jesus put together all of, this, all of us as disciples, we were very different from one another. We weren't all the exact same kind of person, although sometimes we get lumped together. But two of the most different people in this group of disciples who followed Jesus around for a number of years Two of the most different people were myself and Matthew, or sometimes known as Levi. And the reason that we were different is because he and I had a very different approach to the biggest political thing going on at the time. You see, at the time that Jesus walked the earth, Israel was in was being dominated by the Romans. The Romans were occupying our land, our land of Israel. And all of us Jews had different reactions, different interactions about what we thought should be done. And so you have Matthew on the one end, and he decided that he would play along with the Romans. He would side with the Romans. He was a tax collector. And so he was very useful to the Romans because they knew who was wealthy and who was not. He knew who was coming and who was going and who gathered a lot of crops and who didn't. And so he was able to tax his own Jewish people and give money to the Romans for taxation and also line his own pockets with that wealth. That was his approach. My approach was different. I was part of a group called the Zealots. And here's what we did as Zealots. Is our goal, our desire, our purpose in life was to rid the Romans, to be free of the Roman occupation of Israel, because they had taken us by force. And so we as the zealots, I was committed to doing whatever I could to get rid of the Romans. If that meant murdering somebody, if that meant lying, if that meant stealing, if that meant deceiving people, I would do whatever it took in order to free us from the Roman government that was over us. I was a zealot. So that's a view of us as disciples. Now, about a week before Jesus died, there was a day that you probably refer to as Palm Sunday. And I want to read to you an account of what happened on Palm Sunday. And I'm reading from the scroll that Matthew wrote. 
And Matthew and I, though very different, became friends and are now very much united in purpose. And Matthew wrote these words. As Jesus and the disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the town of Bethphage on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of the disciples to go on ahead. Now you may be wondering, which two did he send ahead? I'm not going to tell you. Go to the village over there, he said. As soon as you enter it, you will see a donkey tied there with a colt beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. This took place to fulfill the prophecy that said. And so then Matthew quotes from the book of Zechariah. Tell the people of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming to you. He is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. So Zechariah wrote that hundreds of years before this happened. But Jesus knew that he was fulfilling prophecy. And so he went and he had two of the disciples go take a donkey and its colt, its child, and bring it to him. The two disciples did as Jesus commanded. They brought the donkey and the colt to him and threw their garments over the colt, and he sat on it. Most of the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Jesus was in the center of the procession, and all the people around him were shouting, Hosanna for the son of David. Blessings to the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And what they were doing is they were singing a version of Psalm 119. And so this procession that was happening that, again, you call Palm Sunday, which is what we celebrate today. So there are a number of things happening. There were people who were taking off their cloaks and laying them on the ground as Jesus rode into Jerusalem. And the reason they did that, it was a symbolic act of saying, we put our lives before you. We are behind you. Whatever you are for, we are for that as well. And then they cut palm branches and they laid some on the road and they waved some as Jesus was riding into town. And they also were singing. We were singing, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And we sang this as Jesus rode into Jerusalem. That day had a familiarity to it. Not that I was a part of, but about 160 years before Jesus was born, Israel was under an oppression of a foreign nation. And there was a man named Judas Maccabees. And Judas Maccabees was in some ways a zealot like myself, although they didn't have that term back then. But Judas Maccabees did not want to be under the oppression of a foreign government. And so what he did is he organized a revolt. In history, it's called the Maccabean Revolt. And so he rallied people and fought strong and fought hard, and they kicked the oppressors out of Israel. And to celebrate that, Judas Maccabees rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, and people laid their cloaks before him, and people waved palm branches, and they crowned him as a king, and they sang from Psalm 118 in the same way as when Jesus rode into Jerusalem. For Judas Maccabees, that was his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. I was a zealot, and what I wanted Jesus to do that day is I wanted him to be the conquering Messiah. I wanted the crowds to follow him. I wanted the disciples to follow him. I wanted us to rise up and overthrow the Roman government. That's what I wanted for Jesus. But I realized a little bit later that that's not why Jesus came. That's why I wanted him to come. That's who I wanted him to be in my life. But that is not why he came. He did not come to be a conquering Messiah. When he arrived in Jerusalem, Luke records that he wept tears over Jerusalem. 
And you see, he wept tears because the people didn't fully understand who he was. They wanted him to be a conquering Messiah, as this procession illustrates. And he said about them, he said, peace is hidden from them. They were not going to experience the peace that Jesus can bring because they were looking for a Messiah on their own terms instead of a Messiah on Jesus' terms. I want to fast forward about a week into the future. Jesus had gathered all of us for the Passover meal. And as we celebrate the Passover meal, we had done this as Jews for a thousand or more years. And it was a celebration, a remembrance that God had rescued us from slavery. We were slaves in Egypt and God rescued us through the Passover. And it was a remembrance of that time, of God's faithfulness to us, of God rescuing us. And there was a certain order to how a Passover meal went. But this meal was a little bit different because Jesus interrupted it, if I might use those words, in some different ways. And at one point, he held up bread. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. And then he held up a cup. And he said, this is my blood, which is shed for you. Now, at the time, I didn't understand what that meant. And he spoke about a new covenant. And I kind of understood what that meant, a new way of knowing and understanding God. But it wasn't until Jesus died on the cross that it made sense that that Jesus on the cross was his body broken for us, his blood that was shed for us. Shortly after that, Jesus went to pray in the Garden of Gethsemane. And there were some that were close and there were some that were farther away. And I was one of the ones who was not quite so close. But I heard from those who were closer the words that Jesus prayed. And as he was praying that night, late in the night, he said to his heavenly Father, not my will, but yours be done. And when I got word that that is what Jesus prayed, I realized that that was the prayer that I needed to pray as well. Because I wanted Jesus to be a conquering Messiah. But I needed to give that up and say, not my will, but yours be done. That Jesus didn't come to be a conquering Messiah to make my life and my country the way that I wanted it to be made. He came to die on the cross for sins. He came to be a Messiah for all people, not just a conquering Messiah for a small group of people. As Jesus was finishing his prayer, soldiers came and arrested him. And as these soldiers approached, they took him into custody and they led him to a trial. And that night, Jesus went through four different trials. The first trial was in front of a group called the Sanhedrin. And the Sanhedrin was made up of 71 ruling Jews, Pharisees. And they heard Jesus' testimony, and they were jealous of him. And they said, you're being charged with blasphemy. They accused him and found him guilty of claiming to be God. Now, the ironic thing is that they found him guilty of being God as a crime, but he was, in fact, God. But the Jews didn't have the power, they didn't have the authority to put Jesus to death, and that's what they wanted for him. So they turned him over to a man named Herod. And Herod was the Roman ruler, excuse me, they were handing him over to Pilate. Pilate was the ro- ruling ruler for the Romans in Jerusalem. And so Pilate heard some of Jesus' story and asked some questions, but he didn't see a reason to put him to death. But it just so happened that there was also a man in town at that time named named Herod, Herod the Tetrarch. And Herod was the ruler of the area of Galilee, which is where Jesus was from. And so he was curious. He actually wanted to see Jesus and maybe hear from him or see him do some miracles. And so Herod brought Jesus before him and asked him questions. But Jesus refused 
to answer. And Herod also didn't see a reason to put Jesus to death, and so he sent him back to Pilate. And Pilate said to the Jews who were there, those that were gathered, what shall I do with him? Because he was really looking for an opportunity to free him, to maybe punish him and then let him go. But he asked the crowd that was gathered there. And there's another man named Barabbas. And they said, what should I do with Barabbas? And they said, let him go. And what should I do with Jesus? And they yelled, crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate, it seemed, wanted to let Jesus go. But he wanted to satisfy the crowds instead. And so he washed his hands of it and he said, let his blood be on your hands. And he handed him over to be crucified. Over the course of these trials, Jesus was beaten and abused in terrible ways. At one point early on, they would hit him on the head from behind and they'd say, prophesy, who hit you? If you're really God. And then they took a cat of nine tails, leather laced with bone and glass and rocks, and they beat him 39 times with lashes. 40 times, they said, would kill a man. And so they beat him 39 times, beating him within an inch of his life. And then they put a a robe on him, and they put a crown on him, and they mocked him, and they spit on him. And then eventually... Pilate said to him, you will be crucified. And so they led him to a place called Golgotha. But Jesus was too weak to even carry the crossbar of his cross, which was the tradition. And so a man named Simon, who was from a place called Cyrene, had to carry it for him. That's how weak and beaten Jesus was. And so they got Jesus to the cross to the place of Golgotha, and they nailed his hands into the crossbeam. They nailed it through his wrists and through his feet, and they put him on the cross. And then what they did is they would dig a hole that was about this deep, and they would take the cross, and they would put it just on the edge of that hole, and they would push it up, and that cross would hit the bottom of the hole with a thud. And at that point, Jesus' arms and shoulders were dislocated from his body. Now, when a person dies from crucifixion, we often look at the bloody mess that Jesus was, and we think he bled to death. But in fact, Jesus didn't bleed to death. He suffocated. That the Romans perfected crucifixion to become one of the most horrible deaths that anybody could ever face. And that's what Jesus faced that day. As he was on the cross, and he would go down, and then have to push himself up on the nails to get a breath, and then go back down. There were men that could survive for as long as a day if they had the will to do that, hoping that maybe that they would be rescued, but they never were. But Jesus died quickly because he was giving up his life willingly for you and for me. On the cross, Jesus said a number of things. And I want to share with you two things that Jesus said. One of them was the words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he shared those words because Jesus Christ took all of the sins of all of the world upon himself. He took all of your sins and all of my sins and all of the sins past and all of the sins future. And he took them on himself. And because he was tainted with the sin of the world, God the Father could no longer look upon him. And he turned his back on his own son, Jesus. And so Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Where are you in this? Jesus was quoting from Psalm 22, which begins with those same words. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in Psalm 22, it's a prophecy about what would happen to the suffering servant, the suffering Messiah. 
And the things that are described in Psalm 22 came to life and came to reality in the death of Jesus as he died on the cross for sins. And then the other thing that Jesus said from the cross that I want to highlight to you this morning is the last words from the cross were the words, it is finished. He uttered those words because he wanted those listening and those that would read his story later to understand that what Jesus had come to earth to do was finished. He did not come to be a conquering Messiah. He did not come to give each person what they want. He came to die on a cross for our sins, and his work was finished. I want to give you a couple of things to contemplate on, to reflect on. The first is this. As you think about Jesus, do you follow him on your terms or on his terms? As you think about following Jesus, are you willing to mold your life to who he wants you to be instead of trying to make him who you want him to be? Are you willing to say, not my will, but yours be done? And I'd also encourage you this morning to reflect on the truth that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. That there is nothing that you could do in and of yourself to take care of your sins. And Jesus paid the penalty for your sins. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you for your work in our lives. I thank you that you sent Jesus to the cross to die on the cross for our sins. And God, we know, we know that we find peace in this life when we follow you on your terms and not on our terms. And so God, I ask you and I pray that this morning that you would help us, Lord, that you would help us, Father, to mold, that you would mold us to who you want us to be. And Father, instead of us trying to mold you to who you want, who we want you to be. God, I thank you for your love that was poured out for us on the cross. And God, as we take time this morning to sing, to reflect, to have communion, may that be front and center of our minds. In Jesus' name, amen.